welcome each of you this morning. We have a, a lot of people out with some sickness. We'll have more to say about that a little later. But uh, please turn your hearts to Jesus now as we uh, begin our service and uh, we'll be led in the Apostles' Creed. Let's stand as we <clears throat> read together number 881. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Come Thou Almighty King, number 61. Sunday school is each Sunday at 10 a.m. Worship service is at 11. Our Wednesday night Bible study is on Wednesday nights at 5.30 is fellowship and pizza and 6 o'clock is Bible study. The January, February 2022 upper room is on the table in the foyer. Uh, please stop and get you one as you leave so you have a devotion for each morning. Our mission celebration dinner was scheduled for next Sunday. We all kind of forgot about it. 
And anyway, uh, we're going to postpone that to March with all the sickness and uh, weather issues we've been having in our church, so we're going to postpone that to March. We need to schedule a Christmas tree removal service. <laughs> kind of looks like if everybody might could be here at, uh, what do you all think, Wednesday evening, since we're already all going to be here, we could come up and do that and then go back downstairs. Hey, I'm going to do it. We do that. I'll try to get to it. Okay. So Wednesday evening we're going to take down the tree. If anybody wants to come and help, it would be appreciated. Any other announcements? This morning we have a lot of prayer requests. Our church is, sorry, I've cried all morning. Our church has been hit with some very serious sicknesses. We miss people that's not here with us. We miss Sarah and David. We miss Jeff and, Jeff and Christine. We miss Johnny. Um, this morning, Christine said that Jeff is awake and has drank and ate some noodles, and he hasn't moved his hands or body for days. Uh, Jeff is under hospice care. And uh, I think it was Friday morning or yesterday morning, she couldn't get him to wake up. So let's remember, especially Jeff, and remember Christine, she's taking care of him. Sarah is in need of some surgery. She's in Lexington in a hospital. Um, from what we got this morning, she's in a room, no surgery yet. The team of surgeons don't really know what to do. Uh, so we really need to pray so that it's a very complicated case and this has to do with her stomach issues. So let's keep remembering her in our prayers and David as he's here and not able to be there with her. Remember Johnny is, I'm sure her and Paul are helping take care of David. So uh, uh, many more requests. Hazel's family needs some prayers right now. There's some issues going on with her family. Cooper Coleman is continuing his treatments. Uh, Someone in his family got COVID, so they've been in quarantine. Cooper's supposed to go back to Cincinnati this Wednesday to get back on his treatments because he had to go off of them to get the COVID immunization. So Cooper really needs some prayers as well as his family. Any spoken requests? Shall remember Billy Joe. Yeah, Billy Joe's sick and Carla's home with him. Uh, okay, Bill Murphy starts chemo back tomorrow. I told Ron this morning, I said, Ron, I don't know about you, but I've cried all the way to church this morning praying for our church family. I said, I think our church needs to hit the altar this morning and pray for our church family because it seems like one thing after another is destroying and hurting our families. So I asked Ron if we could have an altar prayer this morning at this time. So if everybody that will come to the altar, I can't kneel at the altar, but I'll stand behind somebody. And uh, Let's have a prayer for our church family, for all those who are sick and traveling, and they need a touch from God in a mighty, mighty way, and we need to call on God to give that touch this morning. If you can, come up and uh, either kneel or stand at the altar. Oh, I don't think I can. <laughs> Let's pray then. Father, as we gather this morning, these few of us in this little church on the hill, and we confess, Father, that we are hurting this morning. We are hurting physically for so many of our congregation that are suffering with their body. And we know their spirit is strong. But we confess, Lord, that it is it is so hard to maintain a, a, a strong spirit in the face of such uh, physical anxieties that, that we face. And we feel that, and we, we feel it in our spirit. And we would just ask, Father, that on behalf of these who have been mentioned and others in our list, on our prayer list, that you would make your presence known to them, Father that they would feel your healing spirit run through them. And at this hour that you would touch our hearts and our spirit, Father, that you would strengthen us and give us the stamina to be a, a minister to them in some way this week. If it's a, a phone call or, or continued prayers throughout the week, we pray that you would give us the strength 
and then wisdom to know what to say, Father, for we are weak. We pray for the strength to do that. For all these we ask, and in the precious name of Jesus, amen. Thank you. <clears throat> Our pastor is spending uh, some time with his, well-deserved time with his family this week. I hope they're not camping out in this rain, but they may be, knowing, knowing Larry. So uh, we're going to do our uh, doxology and prayer this, this morning. Uh, the offering plate is at the back like we have been doing, and so those who can give and have to give, uh, leave your offering in the, in the plate there, and uh, William will lead us. lectionary reading comes from Luke chapter 3 verses 15 through 17 and 21 through 22. As the people were filled with expectations and all were questioning in their hearts concerning John, whether he might be the Messiah, John answered all of them by saying, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I is coming. I am not worthy to untie the thong of his sandals. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork is in his hand to clear his threshing floor and to gather the wheat into the granary, but the shaft he will burn with unquenchable fire. Now when all the people were baptized, and when Jesus also had been baptized and was praying, the heaven was opened, and the Holy Spirit descended upon him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, You are my Son, the Beloved. With you I am well pleased. The Word of God for the people of God. Thank you. Michelle, thanks for sharing your heart this morning. All right, our second lectionary reading is from Isaiah 43, verses 1 through 3. I forgot my glasses this morning. <laughs> but now thus saith the Lord, that the created thee, O Jacob, and he who formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. 
When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee. When thou walk through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. For I am the Lord thy God, the Holy One of Israel, thy Savior. I gave Egypt for thy ransom, Ethiopia, and Seba for thee. The Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, that was fitting for today with the rain coming down after eight inches of snow. Oh, this isn't mine. This is. Um, so I was asked to do uh, another lady moment this morning. Hopefully you guys aren't getting tired of me just yet. Um, and, and actually, Larry asked me, I guess two weeks ago, and I was like, okay, yeah, sure, they'll be fine. Um, and then kind of thinking about it for a couple days and nothing really nothing really stuck on my head and and um, honestly it normally isn't that hard for me to to write the lady moments real quick normally they'll just pop in my head during the shower or like right before bed or or just as I'm driving I'll think oh okay and I'll put a little note in my phone real quick and or and come back to it or just go go through other notes but um, over the last two weeks nothing really came up and then you know the days start getting closer and I'm like ah, I still don't have anything and then it got to last night and I'm like ooh, still don't have anything. <laughs> and, and I'll be honest, I started just thinking, I'm like, maybe I've said all I can say. <laughs> so I'm sure, I'm sure Adam would be happy about that if it was the case. Um, and, and so then I thought, because, you know, we weren't able to be here last week. We were, uh, we were traveling. I'm like, well, maybe I'll just share something about um, New Year's goals and tensions. You know, we all set resolutions. Um, and still, it, it just, the words weren't quite matching up with the idea and the thought and all that. And then um, over the weekend, I, I said to, to someone, I'm like, man. I'm just tired. I don't know if anybody else feels this way. And I think, you know, I think as, as we've all mentioned in the beginning of this service, even though there's, there's a lot of stuff going on. Um, and so that's kind of where, where I came to is, you know, sometimes in the new year we fit, we set amazing goals and we know what we're going to accomplish and we're going to do big things and we're energized and it's new diets and it's, you know, big goals, read so many books, whatever it might be. Um, anybody say any, any new year's resolutions they want to share? Anything? Mine is to not buy any new clothes. I can do secondhand clothes, but for a whole year, we'll see how it goes. <laughs> but that's mine. Any, any other new year's resolutions? We'll ponder on it. That's okay. So sometimes we do have these these big goals, and then other times, if we're on the complete air of honesty, sometimes we just like screech in on two wheels at the end of the year, just like barely making it, just to look up and say, "Oh, I got to do this again." <laughs> Anybody else in that boat? Sometime you don't have to raise your hand. It's okay. Um, I, I think there's there's sometimes a balance, and that's certainly where I've been is a little bit in in both worlds. Um, I was reading the other day and I saw this line in a, a devotion I was looking through. Um, it said, God did not make you to bulldoze your way through life. And it made me think of, of Matthew 11, which we've all heard many times. Matthew 11, 28 through 29 says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And, and I've heard the first verse of that many, many times. You know, 1128 is, is written on stuff. It's on pillows. It's on signs. It's on all kinds of stuff. Um, and it's often used as a motivator, right? A promise. Come to me. I'll bring you rest. I will, I will ease your burden. And it's protection and comfort. But the, the second verse isn't shared quite as often. We don't always see verse 29 associated with it. Maybe it's too long to print. I don't know. But verse 29, take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. And what that says is not only let God carry your way, but that we should watch, listen, and learn how he does it. Gentle and humble. Those are very pretty. Not always easy to do, right? And, and you know, just on, honestly, I've had a, an incredible year. Um, I've had really amazing things happen. I mean, ideas and goals that I wrote out, I mean, happened exactly as I envisioned them. Um, we've been able to win some really great awards. We've been able to accomplish a lot of these goals. We've had amazing su people support us in the right thing. Um, and, I, and I absolutely don't take that for granted. And I tend to have these really big ideas. Is. And for some reason, I just assume they're all going to happen. <laughs> they're all going to come true. But if I'm totally honest, when I'm when I grow my most weary is when I think I have something to do with that. 
And I'm not saying that I don't play a part. I believe God has positioned us all uh, with great purpose. And I think of a quote I'm sure Mr. Platt has heard. Um, Stephanie Richards at the theater we, we share many times. Um, she would share on this project, because how in the world cause it, could a theater, for example, make it in a town of less than 1,000 people for, for 15, 20 years? It didn't make sense. And she used to always tell me, she would say, I knew God's hand was so deep in this project that my only job through the whole process was to stay out of the way and not try and make it my own. Okay? Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. I know when I grow weary is when I try to have too much control, when I want recognition for something I know too well was a blessing, when I don't ask, where is God in my work today, when I don't trust God's timing, and even when I don't trust myself and what I know is God's plan, in essence, when I am not gentle and humble in heart. Psalm 127 says, Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you will rise and you will stay up late, toiling for food to eat, for he grants sleep to those he loves. So basically what that says, you know, as we can look into the new year, unless God is at the center of every goal, every idea, every work day, every family meal, we're just building on sand. So my prayer for the new year for all of us is that we build on Christ and the solid rock in which we stand. And if we're a little tired, that's all right. We've got, we've got, a, we've got a good shoulder to lean on with it. So wish you all a very great, blessed new year. Ron, are you, oh, there you are. Are you welcoming him? Mm -hmm. Oh, perfect. All right. But Enjoy Mr. Platt in just a moment. No, go ahead. I'm so excited. <laughs> Samantha knows uh, Reverend Pratt very well, I think, and she could, could probably talk a long time. But I will say that uh, Reverend Paul Platt has been a teacher at the Grundy Mountain Mission School for over a half century. Um, that, that's saying something. <laughs> and uh, if you're not familiar with the uh, Grundy Mountain Mission School, I urge you to uh, do a little research on that. It's very easy to, to pull it up on the internet. They do amazing work there with children from all over the world, I guess. And uh, those are amazing children. We've had an occasion to uh, see some of those children just out in the community, and they are the most uh, mannerable and well-behaved and cheerful children that you could uh, run into. So they're doing something right there, and uh, they're to be uh, praised for it. So before uh, Reverend Platt comes, I'll give you, uh, read you the scripture text from Luke chapter 15. Now all the tax collectors and sinners were coming near to listen to him. And the Pharisees and the scribes were grumbling and saying, This fellow welcomes sinners and eats with them. So he told them this parable. Which one of you, having a hundred sheep and losing one of them, does not leave the ninety-nine in the wilderness and go after the one that is lost until he finds it? When he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders and rejoices. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep that was lost. Just so, I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than other ninety-nine righteous persons who need no repentance. Let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing upon the message that Reverend Platt will open to us, that it touch our hearts and inspire us for this week. We ask in Christ's name. Amen. If you don't mind, I'm going to talk from this side because I'm not as tall as these two guys over here. That uh, Apostle's Creed sitting in front of the pulpit there comes about right here on me, and it, uh, it's just a little disturbing, that's all. Uh, it, uh, and I appreciate the invitation to be here. Uh, I visited here a couple of years ago, actually. It's been now. Uh, and uh, I'm happy to have the opportunity to come back and, and share with you in a little more formal way. 
and I bring you greetings from Mountain Mission School. And uh, to save you some time, I brought some brochures. They're out there on the table, so you don't have to go on the internet to find out too much. Uh, how <laughs> there is an article there about me. You can take that with a grain of salt. Uh, you know how reporters are. They sometimes magnify stuff. And half a century, boy. <laughs> Uh, that was a shock even to me. I like to say 56, but I don't think about it being half a century. And there are also some cards, <clears throat> some uh, business-type cards, just the right size to put in your pocket, uh, that you can take several of and uh, keep them handy. And if you see a situation, sorry about that, if you see a situation that could be helped by what we do and at the end of the message maybe you'll understand a little bit more about how we do it and what we do num phone numbers are on there contact information is on there give that to the family give that to uh, the, the the social worker give that to anybody that has something to do with it and, per and perhaps we can find a way that we can share and we can help uh, the history of Mountain Mission School has always been closely tied with Pike County. Uh, our founder, born and raised here in Pike County. And uh, we've celebrated 100 years of our history last year, and actually we're going to celebrate it this coming April uh, because we couldn't do it last year. Uh, but we've, we've always been tied to the people of the mountain area of West Virginia and Virginia and Kentucky. And we, we covet your prayers and your support and your awareness uh, in helping children that need, that need help. Have you ever lost anything? Have you ever lost anything that you just could hardly bear that was so important to you that it just that it really just tears you up the fact that it's gone and you can't find it uh, car keys of course are the most obvious because a lot of us are pretty careless with our keys we lay them down here we lay them down there and then all of a sudden we don't remember what we did with them uh, and, uh, you know, if you have a hook that by the door that you put them on when you first come in or you always take them out of your pocket and you put them right there on the dresser, that's not a problem. Uh, but sometimes things can get lost. Uh, I remember that when my uh, the girl that I eventually married and I first started going together seriously you know back in the day it was going steady thing you know and you would exchange rings well of course hers was a college ring and mine was a high school ring because she was that far ahead of me and her ring just barely fit on my little pinky and so i wore her ring on my little finger here and she all she kept telling me you're going to lose that you're going to lose that no, I'm not going to lose it. It fits nice and tight. I'm always aware of it. I'm very careful. Well, one day I was raking leaves and pulling them up and putting them in a basket. And I noticed it was gone. And, you know, panic struck. Sure enough, I'd lost it. I went back to that pile of leaves in the basket and I just about sorted through that leaf by leaf and pebble by pebble hoping to find that ring because I couldn't think of how I could possibly face her and tell her I lost it. Well, I found it. So I didn't have to tell her. Well, I did tell her later on. The, the, the panic that comes when you lose things and here in the 15th chapter of Luke, which we read from, there are three things that are lost. And I'd like to compare those three things to, first of all, how we are lost in the Lord and the church is responsible for helping us. And secondly, to how children are lost and how Mountain Mission School uh, helps in the finding of them. Now, 
the, the scripture gives the, the parable of the lost sheep and then the lost coin and then the lost man or boy. But I want to approach it from a, a, a different order uh, just because it's, it seems to make sense to me in a certain progression. So let's look at the 15th chapter beginning with verse 8. <clears throat> Suppose a woman has ten silver coins and loses one. Does she not light a lamp, sweep the house, and search carefully until she finds it? And when she finds it, she calls her friends and neighbors together and says, Rejoice with me, I found my lost coin. In the same way, I tell you, there's rejoicing in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Now, Jesus, remember, was saying this in response to criticism by the Pharisees, as read earlier, that he was associating with sinners and with these rotten people. And he said, they're the people who are lost. And that's, that was the main point, that God wants lost people to come back and there's rejoicing in heaven. But there's also a couple of other things in here that I think are important. How did that coin get lost? Now, how many of you really care if you reach in your pocket and you pull out a handful of change and a, a, a dime or a nickel falls out and it rolls down the parking lot and you're going to go chasing it? <laughs> Uh, coins are not that important to us unless they're very special coins like a special collection of of uh, what was it they 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 did 50 state quarters remember that where they had a quarter every year or every quarter every fourth of the year whatever it was 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 produced honoring a particular state and and it was important some people thought it was important to collect all 50 you had that that was something else but most of us don't have a whole lot of regard for coins. In fact, I have been collecting coins. I'm probably the reason why the United States is short on coins, uh, because I've been collecting coins for about two years, just dropping them in a, in a little plastic bank uh, in the shape of a long Crayola uh, marker. And I finally decided during Christmas here, I would go cash that in. So I went to the bank with one of these automatic counting machines, and you know, I had almost $200 worth of coins, pennies and quarters and nickels and dimes. That's significant. But most of the time, a single coin is, is not, that, not that big of a deal. But here was this woman who had 10 of them, and she lost one. Now, if you have a, set, a matching set of 10, it might be a little more disconcerting, right, to, to lose one of them. But let me suggest something else here. There is some evidence that perhaps this coin was of, was of so special uh, meaning to her because it was part of the headdress that was frequently worn by married women with 10 coins. And the significance was of it was that if she became displeasing to her husband, or was found uh, in adultery or found unfaithful that in a public ceremony one of those coins would be removed from her headdress and for the rest of her life she would have to be seen in public and everyone would know she's missing a coin she's been a bad woman now if you're a faithful wife and you lose one of those ten coins uh, that's a little more, huh. how do you go out to go shopping for supper that night? How do you go to the market? How do you go get water at the well if you've lost one of your coins? So you can imagine then how, how anxious she was to find that coin and to find it now. Uh, I've lost things, and, and after I have looked as intensively as I can possibly look, I finally reach a point where I say, well, it's around here somewhere. Eventually, it'll show up. And if it's not any big deal, if it's not something, you know, like your driver's license or something like that, uh, it's not going to be a big deal. And eventually, I went without my glasses for three or four weeks because I had laid them down. They had fallen off and were hidden behind a book. 
and I couldn't find them. I thought for sure I dropped them in the yard when I was doing yard work because I've done that a dozen times and I'd searched every inch of the yard and, and where my tools were and everywhere else and couldn't find them and decided, well, they're around here somewhere, maybe I'll find them, but not if it was in this case. She swept the house clean. Every nook and cranny, under every piece of furniture, on every shelf, in every storage jar she could think of, moved heaven and earth to find that coin because it was that important. But how did the coin get lost? Did the coin one day say, I'm tired of hanging out with these other nine guys. I think I'm going to jump off and run down the road here. Yeah. Uh -uh. Did, did the coin get jerked off on purpose by somebody else? Well, probably not, because if it was lost, she would have known whether or not somebody had deliberately taken it off. The coin was lost through no fault of its own. It just happened, and accidents happened. The thread got a little bare. Or maybe she, she brushed up against something in the house uh, as she was walking through the door, a, a, a cloth, a, a hanger or something, and, and, uh, and it, it knocked off. It wasn't on purpose. It wasn't the fault of the coin. It wasn't even the fault of the woman. It just happens. Things like that happen. And you know, people are like that too. There are people in our community and in your larger community here that are lost and they don't even know it. They're lost not because of anything they've done. They're not lost because of some deliberate choice. They're lost because of accidents, because things have happened, because a giant rock fell down on Highway 321 because of a flood down Johns Creek. They're lost because of, of circumstances that have gotten out of control. They're lost because they've lost their job. And, the, and they're lost because of other things that have happened to them that, that they have no control over. A loss of a parent. A loss of a spouse. And we know how how hard that can be on the surviving spouse in many cases where they lose the one they've been with for 54 years. People are lost and it's not their fault. It's our job as a church to seek them, to find them, to help them get through that loss. And you know of people in your church, in your community, that are in that, and you've, you've heard some of them talked about in the, in the prayer list this morning. And that's our job, to find them and to be with them and to help them through that loss. You know, kids get lost that way too. It's not any fault that they've done. Perhaps you know of families that have gotten divorced and what's the main thing that most kids in a divorce situation end up thinking? It's my fault. If I had just been nicer, if I had just done my work better, if I had just made better grades, if I had just, mom and dad wouldn't have. And it's not their fault. There are kids that have lost parents. Families have been burned out of their homes or flooded. And they need a place. They need a place. And Mount Mission School is there for those kinds of children that are lost through no fault of their own. They're lost because of circumstances that have happened to them and they need help. And that's what we're there for. Whether it's get them through the rest of the school year so it's they're in a somewhat stable situation until the family can relocate, till they can find another house, till the father can get a job, whatever the case is, whether it's short term or long term. Many of our children come from overseas. 
uh, from Africa and from Europe, from South America. And they're here because of tragedy that have happened in their families' lives that they can't do anything about. But they need a place. They need help. And that's what Mountain Mission School's about. Let's look at the second story. And this is the one we read from the uh, first part of the scripture, the lost sheep. The lost sheep. Everybody knows that if you've got a hundred of anything, animals, that they're going to be hard to keep track of. And the shepherd's job is to keep track of them. And yet somehow one of these sheep got away, got lost. And it was his job then, having counted the sheep, I can imagine there have been, there have been times when I have uh, had the responsibility of traveling with a group of students. You know, I'm chaperoning a field trip or something else. And, and I've got 10, 12, maybe 15 kids that I'm responsible for. <clears throat> we went to Europe one time with a choir. And every faculty member was assigned six kids. Well, between my wife and I then, the two of us, we had 12 kids that we were responsible for. And you can't imagine how many times I was counting. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Eleven, twelve. Whew. Okay. Because here we are in Germany, you know, or here we are in Austria, and uh, we're walking down the street and we're looking at things and, and sometimes one of them stops and looks at something a little longer than the rest of us. And uh, I, I, I went to uh, Brussels when my son was there with Toyota and we uh, went down into the city of Bruges and he had a son that was about uh, five or six at the time. And there was a parade down the streets of Bruges, and we watched the parade go by, and then we crossed the bridge, and we went on down our sightseeing way, and after a while, Grandma said, where's Noah? Five-year-old. In a foreign country, in a foreign city. So the four of us, we split up in four different directions. One went back the way we came, one went up that street, one went up that street, one went somewhere else, one of them stayed there on the bridge waiting to see if he came back. None of us found him. 45 minutes, an hour. Imagine the anguish. Finally, a policeman comes up. Says, uh, we found this little boy uh, wandering down the street by himself. Uh, you happen to know? <laughs> yeah, that's ours. Uh, they'd taken him to the police station, gave him some ice cream, kept him calm. And of course, he's not the guy who would be all that upset anyway. He probably thought it was a high adventure uh, striking out by himself, but he got lost. Now, how did the sheep get lost? Was it an accident? I, no, not really. It wasn't an accident unless he happened to be walking along and fall off in a hole somewhere and, and, the, and, and couldn't be seen. The sheep got lost because he was eating this grass right here and then he saw a sprout over there. Oh, that looks good. And, and over here and, and over there and then it's Hey, where is everybody? And he's suddenly by himself. He got lost because he was little by little enticed away, not paying attention and just following his nose because sheep are notoriously nearsighted, just going from grass to grass and didn't realize that he was being separated and going a different direction than everybody else. You know, people are like that too. They're lost because they have been enticed away just a little at a time. I mean, who wakes up one morning and says, I think I'm going to become a drug addict. That sounds like a lot of fun. Or I think I'm going to, I think I'm going to become an alcoholic. Or that's not usually the way it happens. It's 
a little here and a little there and a little there and I'm okay I'm just socially drinking and I can handle it and I can quit any time and I've quit four times this last year I can do it again and then one day he goes to the doctor and the doctor looks at him and says you need to be in the hospital you have a failing liver and he has to admit that he can't do it. Little by little, enticed away. Uh, little weed's not going to hurt. I mean, after all, states are becoming more and more lenient on, uh, on marijuana control, and, and so it can't be that bad. And then it's Hey, you know, I got a couple of pills here that you really ought to try because, man, that, that weed's good, but, oh, these pills, man, they'll, they'll make you feel real good. And then it's, you know, that was a good feeling. I think I'll do that again and again, and then it's too late. And it's our job as the church to find those people, to minister to them, and they're the hardest one sometimes. How many times have you gone to find a lost sheep and the sheep didn't want to come back with you? That's, that's why the scripture says he picked it up and put it on his shoulders. <laughs> he didn't say, oh, come on, come on with me. No. He picked it up and forcibly brought it back. And sometimes that's what it takes. And we know that sometimes is intervention. That's our job as a church, is to find these people that are lost. And we don't have to look very far. They're in our community. We know it. We know where they are. And there are ministries that we can help that deal with them. Uh, my middle son has become involved with the Celebrate Recovery Group, uh, who deals with with addicts and, and alcoholics because he needed it and now he ministers with them. Not lost because of accident, but lost because they're just drawn away, unaware, not paying attention, and they get separated. <clears throat> and then there's the lost boy. Well, he's a man. He wasn't a boy. He made man's choices. He said to his father, Dad, I'm tired of being a farmer. Give me my share and let me go do whatever I want to do. Now, you realize what the father had to do? The father had to sell half of everything he had. Half of his land, half of his flocks, half of his herds. He had to sell half. And that's the reason why later on, when he talks to the other brother, and he tells the other brother, everything I have is yours. Because the, the half that he didn't sell was for his other son. He had to sell half of it and give it to the, to the, the son who was rebelling. Now, why was he lost? We know how he went off into a foreign country, he wasted his living, he spent everything, and he became destitute and found himself feeding pigs. And to a Jew, that was the, the, the ultimate degradation of all. And not only was he feeding pigs, but he would have gotten down and eaten in the trough with them. He was so hungry before he finally came to a census. How did he get lost? He got lost because he wanted to be lost. And it's the hardest thing in the world when you have a child who wants to be lost, who doesn't want to follow the example that you've set as parents, who rebels against everything that you've ever tried to say or do. And in spite of everything, he turns against you. He's lost because he wanted to be lost. It was a deliberate choice on his part. I don't want this anymore. I want to do my thing. And there are a lot of people in the world that are like that. They've gone out and they're doing what they want to do. 
And then they look around and think, why is life so hard? Why am I having such a hard time? Just like the, the lost boy who realized that I've got servants at home that are living better than I am. Let me go home and just become a servant. There are children lost that way too. There are children who are lost because they want to be lost. And we've had our share at Mountain Mission School. There have been times when we've had children who, who didn't want what we wanted, who didn't want what we had, who were brought by their, their parents or their guardians for the benefit of what they could get, and they didn't want to be there, and they ran off and they left. And many a day, yeah, it hasn't happened recently, thank the Lord, but many a day in the past I've driven down the road and found them walking along the highway and had to convince them to get back in the car and let me take them back. I don't want it. I hate that place. And sometimes all you can do is just hold them in your arms. I had a little girl, probably 10, 12 years old, ran off and I, I went after her. I found her. She wasn't going to come. She was thrashing and yelling and screaming and all I could do was just hug her until she calmed down and then bawled tears. She's now a friend of mine. As she grew up, graduated, went to college, made a life for herself. But somebody had to intercede for her. And that's what Mountain Mission School does, even when they don't want it. Now, we sometimes require things of them that they don't want to do. You know, no child likes to make his bed, clean his room, do the dishes, carry out the trash, all, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. And that's how we teach them. We teach them to do the things that need to be done for their benefit. Otherwise, they'd be living in a trash heap. Otherwise, they'd be living in, in dirty, wearing dirty clothes and sleeping on dirty sheets and, and rat infested and cockroach infested areas because they're not keeping things clean. So we teach them how to keep, keep things clean and how to take care of themselves and how to dress well and how to behave, especially when you're out in public, uh, how to be polite. But there's a place. And you know, perhaps there are children in your community that are lost that way, that need a place a Mountain Mission School can provide for them. We did a survey <clears throat> with the uh, Bristol City Schools, Bristol, Virginia, I think it was, the Virginia side of it, Bristol, Virginia Schools. And we found out that there were 70 Seven zero homeless children in their school district. Seventy homeless children. And here we are, 70 miles from them. Why don't we help them? Why don't they let us help them? That's part of what we do at Mount Mission School. And that's part of what we do in the church. To rescue the lost. So we have three lost things. One was lost by an accident. No fault of its own. One was lost by being enticed away and, and not really paying attention, and the other one was lost because he wanted to be lost. And it doesn't matter why or how they got there. It's they're there. And that's where we come in. That's where you come in as a church. It, we don't even need to know why. We just need to help. And if you can and you, and you have ministries through, through, your, through your church and through your organization, 
that supports these kinds of things, that's where you need to be contributing and, and being useful. And if you can do something personally in your own life to help, to serve, to take stuff, to collect stuff, to, to visit, to do whatever it needs to be done. And Mountain Mission School is just 60 miles away. And we have a lot of children from Kentucky over the years. And we have an opportunity that you can open up for those that need the help. Now, what about your own personal life? What kind of lost are you? Are there things in your life that that have snuck in there that you don't really you didn't really plan on you need to get rid of has something happened in your life that 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 has an was an accident and you've turned sour or you've you've somehow uh, neglected doing the things that you ought to be doing is it possible even that you have turned away and turned your back Today's a good day to start over. I think we have a closing hymn. Uh, if you want to come up and, and do that, if you need to make a decision to serve in a better way and to let God have control of your life, we invite you to come. Stand and sing number 420, Breathe on Me, Breath of God. Let's sing the first verse of number 664, <clears throat> sent forth by God's blessing. Mm -hmm. 